Welcome back, listeners. It's glad to have you back here on this afternoon or morning, whenever you're depending upon listening to it, to uh, Learning from Friends. I'm your tour guide, Cade Curtis. Funny thing before we start recording on this episode is this is the second time I actually having to record this one. Uh, after recording it, I realized after I saved it and I started opening up and editing it, there was a lot of issues that came up and the file became corrupt. I spent about four and a half hours, five hours trying to figure out how to fix it. I called around, got a whole bunch of different people to come in and get a look at it, and the file was lost forever. So it will be the episode lost in a infamy and talked about for long periods of time, and there will be a lot of uh, myths that will start to appear to it as it becomes 25 and 100 episodes of uh, this podcast. It'll be, oh yeah, that episode six, you know, I wonder whatever happened to us to that. So we're going to call this episode six and a half because of the, uh, it uh, was lost in the, the ethers forever. The fun fact of that episode actually wound up being two hours and 40 minutes once we finished recording. And so it was going to either be edited and cut into two parts or just become a two hour and 40 minute long episode. So who knows where that kind of could have gone in that direction to it. But um, to come back in for today, I have my friend, Will Fry, who I have literally not seen for seven years before this. We went to high school together, and after high school, we each kind of went our separate ways. We each have, you know, as life happens, you continue to kind of go out and about. And as soon as I, over the years, we kind of followed each other on Facebook and things like that, I posted up saying, hey, I'm starting this podcast. I'm going to do some uh, individual ideas. Anybody have thoughts or think this may be a good idea or a bad idea, reach out. And I recorded, I think, two episodes by this point, and I'd put one of them out, and Will reached out and goes, hey, would you like to have an archaeologist come on and talk? And I was like, you know what? Heck yeah, that sounds awesome. Very unique and, unique and different for that. So today, when he comes in, we're going to talk about the field of social science uh, with a focus on archaeology and anthropology. And Will has this very interesting passion for gardening with his biodiverse, organic, permaculture, no-till, organic garden. It's a very mouthful for me to be able to say on that. He's also going to talk about foraging, which he does, along with the CRMs, which stands for Cultural Resource Management Firms, and the importance it is to taking care of our history and preserving it uh, long-term. Welcome, Will. Hey, thanks for having me back. Oh, yeah. for uh, I think we recorded this literally two days ago, and now we're, we're going <laughs> for it again. Hopefully this time uh, I won't mess up and, and lose it. Yeah, and we can uh, we can be more concise. Yeah, <clears throat> it'll be nice just to kind of to get that in, in place to it. So it's almost like a a second chance. Maybe we'll we'll call it that, or we'll call it our second date. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Will, go ahead and describe yourself to our audience here. Sure. So uh, I am a uh, thirty three uh, year old uh, human, um, and I don't eat. Uh, dairy uh meat or fish um and i curate it's it's roughly a um 3000 to 3500 square foot uh vegetable and herb garden uh i worked for the sequoia regional library system for um close to 12 years before i became a archaeological field technician for um an atlanta based uh cultural resource management firm uh and uh, that was after I earned my Bachelor's of Science in Anthropology from Kennesaw State University. Um, you know, I, I like listening to uh, folk music and uh, punk music and reading science fiction novels. Like, uh, I think I've read everything by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. and, and Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, and I, I play Dungeons & Dragons. I'm a uh, dungeon master. Nice. With with being a dungeon master, what does that all entail for those listeners that do not know what D and D Dungeons and Dragons is? Oh, a lot of preparation and a lot of diving into the uh, fantastical mind of of your um, loving DM, uh, and you just get to run around in a world that they create or um, that they that they have sourced from official or unofficial sources. So it's wherever your mind can take you. Um, whatever you want to say or do, and uh, it can get really crazy. It's a lot of fun. So how long is your current campaign so far that you're involved with? Uh, I think we've been going for um, 
four months, I think. And uh, before that, I did one with some family members. Uh, and that one lasted probably a year. Uh, and it, that one's on pause right now, but we'll pick it back up. That's awesome to be able to have that reconnections and be able to do something long term uh, like that. Because it's really good for just kind of keeping people bonded and also an escape from the world that's going on around us definitely it's a it's a great creative process yeah for for sure we've gotten it's not the same level of doing dungeons and dragons but thanks to covid <laughs> one of those blessings that covid gives us is um we created a game night with a couple of friends where we sat back in with people from two different states where we sit back and we just play random games online with different people through Zoom. So thank you, um, COVID, for kind of reconnecting us together in that sense. And are you doing some of your um, D and D remotely with people, or do you have all in this? Are you able to all meet together? Oh, uh, we I do it remotely. Uh, I use some internet tools, uh, virtual tabletop, and um, uh, uh, audio software um, that connects us all. Um, very popular one. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but anyways, uh, yeah, we do it virtually. Sweet. Now, you had a lovely mention there of punk rock here. I We are kindred spirits in that kind of realm. What is your... Tell me about your passion for punk rock music. All right. Uh, I always like the, you know, do-it-yourself ethos and, and really the um, controversial uh, topics that they can... Uh, spaces that they can inhabit. Um, it's generally built around uh, very passionate people, um, and I, I really appreciate that, and... Uh, there's a lot of other music out there that does the same thing, but um, I like, you know, the older, I guess, uh, origin kind of punk, uh, especially, let's say, um, in the in the American sense, uh, we will progress past, you know, um, the origins of, of it, like from the Velvet Underground and whatnot. But furthermore, I like uh, Minor Threat is really cool. I think I have a lot of respect for the uh, front man, Ian Mackay. And he got really into archiving and uh, worked with, um, he's he's done a lecture for the Smithsonian, which was really cool. It's about an hour long, and I think it's uh, it's available online if anyone is interested in watching it. Um, and I also like, uh, I think Bad Brains was a really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, definitely a cool uh, American punk band. And uh, then across the waters in the, in the British Isles, we have, uh, I have a lot of respect for Crass. Um, they were like a peace punk uh, band that um, breached a lot of topics. They got they were very political. Um, they made fun of uh, Margaret Thatcher a lot, which I, I appreciate. <laughs> and uh, there was another one um, called Flux of Pink Indians, which was also uh, very cool. They um, again were very political uh, peace punks, um, and they also address topics like uh animal rights and stuff like that i enjoy definitely the the passion that comes out of the scene that's what really draws me in is it's making a statement that some people are afraid to go into in in that direction and it also is that diy do-it-yourself movement is phenomenal and what that's created in my opinion really changed a lot of the music industry as a whole for people feeling comfortable enough to do it and be able to put that stuff out there and I, I'm an avid collector of vinyl records. And I, sometimes if I get, if I'm looking out at a Goodwill, I always go to the record sections. And sometimes you may get lucky and find little gems like that for sure. When I was up in DC recently, I was able to go, I can't remember the name of the library that's housing it. Um, but the, I can't remember the lead singer from Fugazi has actually started. Yeah, that, created, was, that was Ian McKay. Oh, that is. Oh, my, I keep forgetting. My brain is jumping back and forth. Yeah. he Because he was in Fugazi and he was in Minor Threat. Right. I keep forgetting betwe- that he jumped between that. Again, as as a punk fan, I should have been like, uh, that. that's a avid scar and mark against me now. No, I'm no. forgetting that. He started that as well, that archives helped preserving all these posters and all this um, manuscripts and stuff from other years, videotapes and stuff that he has created outside of D.C., it's not coordinated with the Smithsonian, but it should be. Yeah, it should be. It really should be. And that times, maybe we could start a petition here. Uh, t- call your local congressman. Call, you know, be able to contact the Smithsonian. Make this happen. We should start a, a punk band off of this, Will. There you, you go. Know? I mean, yeah, it's we'll just... we call the archivists, you know? I like that, honestly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just so raw and emotional. And that's what I, one of the most, you know, things I appreciate the most about it. 
Yeah, it, for sure. It, it's it's definitely brought a lot of good attention to movements that really, in all honesty, would be probably overlooked if if not brought that attention for it. For I, I got reintroduced into a whole bunch of the DC punk scene again after I read Dave Grohl's Storytellers over the uh, sum, not summer, but over Thanksgiving break. And I was like, oh man, I forgot about that band. Oh wow, really? That band was, you know, at one point was like, originated out of DC and all this different stuff. But it's the, I think it's really cool on how bands really are super groups. Really, when you think about it, like, oh no, it's not a super group. No, no, the, the original lineups came from other bands over the years and the influences they were able to bring together. So that's, I mean, so, so cool. I have to give you some credit here for back in high school, you introduced me to a lot of different bands that I had not heard of before because you used to wear some band t-shirts from time to time. Mm, right. And I always thought you were very interesting. Like that for me, the, the quintessential punk kid for me in high school, you were very just kind of to yourself at times, but whenever you spoke, you really spoke about something and kind of that, that passion to it. So anytime you spoke, I listened and I always thought that was interesting. Um, the different bands that you were able to kind of provide to me. Cause my brother was giving me stuff from college and I was getting stuff from you as well. And it was just kind of that nice little mixture of seeing two different worlds kind of colliding together. And I, I deeply appreciate what you did for that, even though you may have not known that till, no, no, till now. Thank you. <laughs> um, what was some of your memories from high school that you would kind of have? Cause we kind of sort of like tinged on circles, but not really. Um, yeah, we, I think you came in uh when i was a sophomore we had an art class together um and uh we had some good memories in there uh and i remember you always wore converse like you were just every I, I, those those were your only shoes i think i, I no did idea. until they sold out to nike True, yeah I, that's when i stopped wearing them. <laughs> as soon as they sold at nike i was done <laughs> yeah yeah i guess i was a kind of a pretentious converse wear in that sense. But, um, you know, they, there's a lot of memories there uh, that are pretty good. But, you know, I kept to myself, like I said, or like you said, but, um, you know, with my own little circle of friends, we would uh, we would just hang out and have a good time with each other. Um, spend a lot of time after school just hanging outside because uh, we liked it. We liked, you know, we didn't have to go home right away. We just chilled out. Um, a terrible memory is when I, when I got, uh, put in handcuffs for, uh, pulling down a security camera wearing a Spider-Man mask. That was pretty awful. Yeah. I did not know that was you until you mentioned that on Saturday when yeah. we were talking. I was like, that was you? Yeah, that was awful. That was me. Um, so I got punished for that. But, uh, from what I understand, it was, it was a really good time for my friends. They, um, held up a lot of signs for the, that said like free willy and stuff at like a pep rally or something. I'm, I wasn't there, but apparently they uh, they made a good show of it. And um, I remember, like, a, even a year later, I saw someone with a binder that said "Free Willy," and I was like, "I have no idea, I have no idea who you are. Like, <laughs> you, you don't even know who I am." But okay, thanks for I guess supporting me. <laughs> hey, that, it's, exactly. It's, it's interesting the little odd impacts of that. I remember my story. Another one of the major stories that we were reminiscing on on Saturday was there is this infamous picture that we will hopefully one day uncover from our class. We had Dr. Stone, who was the one of the longest standing teachers in Georgia history for a long period of time and how long she stayed active as a, as a teacher, especially in the art program. She was a leader in the art department and developing it uh, for the state curriculum for a while as well. And it was very, uh, we got her on towards some of her last couple of years of teaching. We had to do a self-portraits of not self portraits but portraits of a person across from us sitting there and i drew mine i mean he drew me and the next day i wound up drawing will in my picture drawing skills is that of a, probably about a five ten year old at best kind of, kind of level and uh it turned out to be quite hilarious one of our friends was like i want that from you because i think i made a 50 or 60 on it <laughs> once it got graded and that thing lived on in infamy i got it back senior year and i cannot find it if it is found, do I have permission to uh, use it as the background for the uh, the episode? One hundred percent. Please do that. That I wish I could see that picture again. That was that was a good one. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to find this thing. I, I've got a little bit of time before this is posted up, and I'm hoping that it'll pop up. If it doesn't, we'll figure it out here. And then mm -hmm. on those realms, if not, maybe it'll pop up in another ten years and that kind of maybe. Realm yeah. Too. I mean, bad line drawings are a thing I see on Instagram. So you know, 
it's you were ahead of the curve there. <laughs> I guess I was. It's a, it's, a, it's a true statement on you never know with being ahead of the curve. I feel like a lot of the times uh, we, we kind of jumped ahead a couple of years on people whenever. Oh, yeah. Is that weird? We were trendy before that was trendy kind of deal. It's just, <laughs> we already lived through that. So those are always good high school years. Things like that uh, for sure. We're going to transition here real quick over to talking about anthropology and archaeology here. For those listeners, they're they're drastically different fields, but they do have connections because they are a part of the social science world. Will, can you give us a definitions here or in differences kind of between archaeology and anthropology before we kind of go a little deeper? Sure. So uh, anthropology is kind of like an, a large umbrella. It's uh, it's It's very interdisciplinary as a science and um it's important to remember that it is a science it uh it focuses on humans um focusing on their uh origins um from you know all the way back to australopithecus that i think that was uh if i remember all my schooling right 13 million years ago 13.6 or something like that um through all the subspecies um and uh going all the way to uh even now, uh, you have you can study uh, businesses as um, as a form of culture. I mean, you can study um, so many things under anthropology. Uh, but yeah, from their origins to every aspect of their following cultures. Um, so the word anthropology is derived from the Greek word anthropo, meaning human being uh, or humankind, and logia, meaning uh, or translated as knowledge of or the study of. Um, so the study of humans and, um, so it's a science because it follows the scientific method. So that means, um, you perform experiments, uh, you, you, ob you observe, um, subjects, test subjects, certain cultures to gain, uh, facts and data. Uh, and then these facts and data are used to form a prediction or a hypothesis, um, which can become, uh, an official theory if it's supported by empirical evidence. Uh, so this is the scientific process, essentially, as it pertains to anthropology. Um, and I'm going to, before I move on to archae excuse me, archaeology, I'm going to give you a few quotes from uh, some very key people uh, in the anthropological field. <clears throat> so one of them is by E.B. Tyler, who defined culture... Uh, as that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. And that, uh, that definition is still used today, and I believe it is maybe 80, 80 years old or, or so. Uh, and then there's another uh, quote from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, uh, who was a cultural anthropologist and he said, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance. He himself has spun. I take culture to be those webs. And uh, then the third quote, um, just so uh, you get a little bit, a little bit more here, is uh, from Gordon Willey and uh, Philip Phillips, who both said, Arche archaeology is uh, anthropology or it is nothing. And by that they mean that... Um, so there are four fields of anthropology, uh, cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, or physical anthropology, uh, linguistic anthropology, and archaeology. So archaeology is one of the four major branches of uh, anthropology. And then under that you have so, so many other little, you know, um, specializations. Uh, but as an as a anthropology student, uh, you learn all four fields. And you learn about um, each one pretty, uh, at least on the surface in undergrad, and then it gets even deeper in, in your graduate studies. Um, but in archaeology, you have uh, historic archaeology, prehistoric archaeology, uh, underwater archaeology, biblical archaeology, and a whole bunch more. Um, I, I do uh, historic and prehistoric archaeology. Um, and so the archaeological record uh, goes back, uh, 55 years before present. So, um, that's how something is determined as historical. Wow. Yeah. So that always, that moves up, you know, every single year, it's always 55 years before present. 
Interesting. I would have never thought that that was the number. Yeah. I wonder how, how do you know how that was chosen? I, I actually don't. It feels I don't like they that. randomly just like pulled out it. I was like, hey, we're, I'm a Dikembe Matembo fan, 55 years or something like that. That's, you know, <laughs> let's pull something in place. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. For, for those Dikembe Matembo fans, uh, no, 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 no. Good old Atlanta <laughs> Hawks. Uh, here we go. Uh, sorry about that. I went on a little small bit there. But uh, so. That is really fascinating that they, they they choose that as the back number. I, I can't get off of that now. Like that that random number is kind of like with I think it's antique cars is twenty or thirty years. Like it's I don't know how they come up with these arbitrary numbers. Yeah. Something that if you know this information, pop it in the uh, comments because I think that would be something interesting that knowledge to kind of pop out there. What else you got for us, my friend? All right, so. Um... I can go ahead and talk about uh, what do I do in archaeology, if you like. Do it. Let's All do it. All right. So uh, I am in a field called uh, cultural resource management. So that's CRM for short. Uh, I work for a private business, which is a um, consulting firm. So it's a CRM firm. Uh, and it its entire purpose is um, to be the arm of a, a few pieces of legislation uh, one of them, we're going to go all the way back to 1966 under the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. And uh, during that time, they enacted the National Historic uh, Preservation Act. And so... Also known as the uh, NHPA. Correct. For the, the continual NHPA. acronyms. Uh, and so un- under that, um, there was a specific section, section 106, uh, that dealt with all kinds of uh, cultural resources um, with its strict focus on uh, historic properties. Uh, So that includes archaeological sites, um, buildings, uh, battlefields, all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, that gave a federal agency to um, anyone wanting to develop uh, a project, let's say a road, a bridge, um, a pipeline, any, any major infrastructure project that gets federal money um, and oh. state money has to perform a section 106 review. Uh, and so what they do is, um, let's say GDOT wants to do a road project. Uh, they have to contact the um, State Historic Preservation Office, and they have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops with them. And then the State Historic Preservation Office and that company um, will determine uh, if there are uh, historic uh, properties that will be affected by the project. And oh, if wow. there are, then they have to collect bids from private companies, uh, cultural resource management firms, uh, which there are a lot. Um, they collect bids. They go with probably the lowest bidder or, um, you know, I'm sure there's other factors that that are involved there. But uh, yeah, so they'll choose a company. And then um, if my company's chosen, uh, it goes into uh, like the planning stages. So I'm I'm an archaeological technician. So I am I'm like the bottom rung of the ladder, and then above me there's you know a, a hierarchy. Um, you have crew chiefs. Uh, you have um, next you have a principal investigator who is really um, the whole. Uh, they plan almost the whole thing, and then you have senior archaeologists um, at the at the company that are above them that you know help too. And uh, so once the project is laid out, they have the project area. They use a random sampling pattern um, to determine where the tests are going to be. And uh, they're usually in, you know, lines running, you know, um, some some degree, you know, in, in a direction northeast, southwest, whatever, um, that we can follow with a compass if we need to. And uh, they're spaced, uh, I believe they're spaced 30 meters apart. And uh, so every 30 meters, we dig a hole. So this is, there are three phases of archaeology. Okay. Um, Phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is shovel testing. So I grab a shovel, I grab a screen, um, and just so you know, if you ever see any people on the side of the road carrying a shovel and a screen, wearing a yellow vest, what they're doing is a a cultural survey. They are are doing archaeology. what and, does the screen look like in terms of size? Because uh, some of us think of like maybe like a sift, like we maybe cook with. What? How big is this screen that we're kind of looking at? So I think they are like 
something like maybe like two feet by you know a foot and a half or or so they're rectangular um like the size of like a decent suitcase um and it's a quarter inch screen uh so anything below you know a quarter of an inch in size and diameter will go right through the screen um but anything above that is what we save and uh so yeah we go out there uh and we get on our transect our line that we're supposed to dig we have a little handheld gps unit we use and uh go to the first test um and start digging and uh what that looks like in this state because each state is different uh in this state in the state of georgia the regulations are uh 30 centimeters um a 30 centimeter hole uh that is uh in a circle you know uh radius or diameter wet rather um so i dig a circular 30 centimeter hole um, and I dig down into subsoil, which here is generally going to be red clay. Or okay. if it's um if it's been developed area, you're going to hit saprolite, which is called is the parent material, right? It's it's even older than you know the red clay. It's it's we're talking about millions of years old. Um, and so when you dig uh, into the red clay, you know you've hit a level that humans weren't even probably on this continent or. Um, anything so you're not going to find history below um the subsoil uh which uh interesting fact here all this red clay if no one knows came from uh africa from when our continents were all going crazy and colliding um the part we're in now the southeastern united states um scraped uh where morocco is you know and it, it got a lot of the red um you know dirt and and material there and then you know millions of years later we separated that and it, it turned into clay because our our uh environment is very different but anyway so that's amazing i yeah. had never even thought of that so you want to go to morocco just you know dig up some red clay you're basically there wow but um you know set up so, a little beach and say hey i'm on a <laughs> i'm on a vacation i'm going to morocco there you go but um you know, that was like 400 million years ago. But anyway, so... Only yesterday, you know? Yeah, only Only, only 400 million. It's fine. So, uh, you dig down and we hit... If I hit the red clay, then I have to dig 10 centimeters into it. Um, and then my test is done. And uh, I take out my notebook. It's a write in the rain. You know, I can... It's all weatherproof. Um, and I write in pencil, you know, um, the transect number I'm on, the shovel test I'm at, um, whether the test was positive or negative. Uh, I then I note my uh, stratification. So if there were multiple levels of dirt, um, let's say there were three strats in my hole, uh, I have to note um, the color. There's a very specific color system I have to use. It's called the Munsell color system. And um, so I have to note the colors. I have to note the consistency. I have to say it's a um, you know reddish brown uh, silt loam. Um, and that was from zero centimeters to eight centimeters and then the next one i can say eight centimeters to 16 centimeters is uh yellow uh sandy clay um something like that um and that's those aren't like these exactly official things that i'm supposed to say but it, it gets a point across to you all um all the jargon that we have to oh yeah say and learn and do but trying to then explain it to someone who's not in the field it's a lot easier when you can break it down that way because right we have so many acronyms and so many different like terminology here and someone grabs a paper and starts reading it. That's why we get so confused when we grab a political, not political paper, but say, well, maybe political paper, but we grab a paper out of archive and go, what is this saying? I, I don't, yeah. I don't get this. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's really nice working in areas that, uh, you don't have to dig very deep. Uh, but like if it's, if it's been graded, you know, if you're on the side of the road, all that dirt was brought in from somewhere else. Usually it's it's fill, you know, road fill that they build up the road here or there to, to put it on. So you dig into it and you're instantly in red clay. Um, so you still dig uh, down to a certain point. And uh, recently we've been digging to 20 centimeters in <clears throat> into the clay. And I think there must be some like new regulations or maybe like sometimes the contract, uh, the person who issued the contract uh, wants it to a certain depth maybe. So, uh, so most of everything I've been digging recently has been to, to uh, 20 centimeters into sub. So 
that's sad. But you know, if I if I have a job in South Georgia, that's that's so sandy there, and I routinely we dig to eighty centimeters, which um, drastically is, different. Yeah, which is about you know a little more than four feet or so. Uh, it's about the the size of a um, the handle of a shovel. So uh, a little thirty centimeter wide hole, eighty centimeters deep. It gets pretty ridiculous trying to pull material out of that and sift it all and you being at the bottom of the totem pole oh, you're yeah. the one that's having to to shove oh, yeah. in there and do that definitely so uh and the problem well no this isn't a problem this is pretty just something that rarely happens if you find something at 80 centimeters and uh usually your crew chief is is with you there uh on site and they determine it's uh historically important you have to keep digging until you stop finding artifacts oh wow yeah so you know you could dig to 90 or 100 and then stop finding something. And then, you you know, it's like, why was that even there? I mean, that's so old. It's 80 centimeters down is so, you know, that's incredibly old. And maybe it's just contextually um, there. It's there for a different reason. Maybe a bulldozer pushed it there and you were digging into a pile of dirt that's been there for 50 years. You know, you don't know that. Oh, wow. That's, so, that's um, true, especially with all the housing and building that whenever they're grading stuff right. out, how that changes so yeah, an archaeology context is everything. So uh, that's something else we have to note in our our notes. If if it's disturbed, if the area is clearly disturbed, um, we have to note that because our notes go back to the PI, the principal investigator who writes the report on um, the site we've been doing. So uh, they have to have all the context, all the information, and uh, they they have to do all the research too. So they dig through historical records and all sorts of um, archives and stuff like that to find out what happened on this property. Wow. That's a, a lot of just start prep work yeah. in order to, to get moving. And I'm glad that we have legislation, stuff like that in effect in order to really learn properly about the history. And before someone can randomly just start knocking things down or yeah. randomly start kind of building. So the whole point of all of that, all of what I do is it culminates in um, the properties. If they are eligible, if we find enough stuff, if we find enough cultural material, that is historically important, those sites become eligible to be nominated to be put on the uh, National Register of Historic Places, which in effect doesn't really guarantee any protections, but um, you know it's definitely taken into consideration when uh, a state historic preservation office looks at something uh, with a company that wants to develop something. And uh, so, you know, it's, it, while it doesn't guarantee protections, it can offer some um, you know, a, a heavier hand in preserving that area. How long are you in this area whenever you're given a project? Are you there for <clears throat> weeks, months? Um, it, it really depends. So uh, I was on a project that lasted uh, about six weeks in North Georgia, um, and it was really cool. Uh, a lot of shallow holes on, like, the hills and the ridges, but when we got out into the floodplain next to the river, um, we were digging 80 centimeters down, and I was finding... Uh, pot sherds or pottery sherds. Um, that's S H E R D S. Um, you did hear me right. Uh, and so that's like a little piece of uh, pottery from a, um, a Native American um, craft. So uh, I would I was finding those all the way down to eighty. Uh, so that's wow. pretty old. Um, that is, yeah, exactly. That's extremely old. But we do know contextually that in uh, Georgia and in North Georgia, um, pottery hit the cultural scene later than it did in other areas of the uh of the united states so our stuff was probably from the woodland era um and so for anyone who wants a timeline here so you have the ice age which was the um pleistocene um era uh which was about uh what fourteen thousand years ago and then you have um in in terms of culture uh we have the archaic period which is uh, about 12,500 years ago um, to, oh man, I have my notes here. Come on. I forget all these things, even though they're part of my job. Um, but I think it goes to about uh, 6,000 years uh, before present. And then you have the woodland period. Um, no, the archaic goes from 12,000 years ago to uh, 3,000 years ago, roughly. Uh, and then you have the woodland period that goes to about 3,000, 3,500 years before present to um, like 750 years before present. And then you have 
the Mississippian period um, that goes all the way up into contact with uh, Europeans. And then you have everything everything after that's considered uh, post-contact. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so those are the eras there. But uh, woodland period is generally um, when you'll find pottery from around here. Maybe the archaic, maybe the late, you know, terminal archaic. So on the West Coast, do they find further back? Is this more during the woodland period that they found it in the East Coast and it goes further back in the, you said, the West Coast? It, it could. Uh, I'm not totally familiar with West Coast archaeology in that I do know it's very different. They don't do a lot of digging out there. Uh, because there's a lot of desert so oh that's true you know, the sand and all that has probably yeah. carried and moved things around and also it's just degraded everything anything that is is not rock or stone is just gone you know turned to dust um even bodies out there you know bones just unless they're in a cave you are, you're not going to find remnants um of human life oh, i didn't think about that at yeah. all and they do something called pedestrian survey which just means they walk around and they look so if you're, huh. you know, if I do CRM work on the West Coast, um, you just walk around. Uh, you, and it's also very different over there because you have a tribal historic preservation office as well. And so they'll send out a tribal representative to walk around with you. And um, if you do have to excavate anything, they have to observe you um, doing it. And then even in some places, some of that dirt is considered theirs, right? So if every um, so many buckets that you excavate you have to put on a tarp for them to go through and then there's buckets that you have to go through it's um archaeology on the west coast is, is very different than over here on the east coast. wow i would have never thought of that separation different just by you know a couple thousand miles yeah yeah different environments so um yeah over here in the uh in the east coast we have a lot more development you know uh, you know, colonizers came here and uh, developed this area first. So um, even if we you you find a property, a CRM company finds a property and does, deems it eligible in um, you know uh, the Midwest or the West Coast, there's still a lot of land that you know a pipeline can go around or a railroad or something can go around these areas, and they can just say, okay, that is you know your surveys say that is historically important. We're just going to stay away from it. On the East Coast, we can't do that as well because, number one, the terrain is so different, especially in the Appalachian, you know, Ridge and Valley areas. You know, if they want to build a pipeline, like they have, you know, maybe just one option. Yeah. So even limited, if they find sure. something, they have, they say, okay, we have to. We This is our the only route we have. Um, so you move on from the phase one and you do a phase two or a phase three. And so that is the full scale excavation. And that is you're trying to save as much historical data you're trying to take all of the artifacts collect all of the data you can within a certain small time crunch um you have to take all that data and uh preserve it as best you can and that usually wow. goes into an archive um somewhere because you know that that pipeline that road whatever it is it's it's gonna be built you know so um even even there you know as you see historically it, it doesn't matter that it could have been eligible for the national register they have to build that piece of infrastructure right there so um thankfully jobs exist where we and laws exist um so that we can recover as much as we possibly can and that that's something that i never would have thought about that that's the progress a man writes off a lot uh, whenever it comes to being able to build this infrastructure and build this stuff in place i can only truly imagine what's underneath the ground for some of these major cities that have been in existence for a long period of time. Like looking at New York City, I can only imagine what's really underneath there for for that frame. And then also looking into Atlanta, things like that, how deep and how much things have kind of changed and they've got to keep building. They've got to kind of keep going to, to build these water lines, to build the gas lines and put all this kind of stuff in place. Right. But thankfully, again, thank you, Lyndon B., for uh, putting that into place in order to save what we do have left on that to be able to continue generations forward right and um you know parts of my job are also governed by the national environmental protection act so there are sections of that that also guarantee that this work has to be done that certain reviews have to be done um for uh, for project to uh happen and you know uh just so in case anyone's wondering like what happened why why what made these laws exist well things were happening like 
um, I believe in St. Louis in like the 1920s and 30s, they were building roads and they were using uh, Native American mounds. Um, like close to us, there's the Etowah Indian mounds. Um, so they were using these mounds as road fill. They just scoop them up in bulldozers and deposit them and build roads on top of them. Uh, because they were just, to them, they're just giant piles of dirt right there. But um, to the Native American cultures, those were um, more than that. Uh, they were a ceremonial space, but they were also mortuary mounds. So there were a lot of bur bodies buried in these mounds, um, usually um, high status people. But um, yeah, so those were literal grave sites that they would just scoop up and turn into road beds. And, uh, you know, eventually, eventually some people got angry enough to make legislature about it, you know? So thankfully, um, yeah, thankfully these laws exist now. Yeah, it does make a, a big difference. And that's why sometimes I don't think about the process. Oh, that road took, you know, two or four years to be able to get kind of starting break. Why are they not breaking ground and working on that? That's, that's why. And that's, I'm grateful for that. And uh, as working, I teach middle school history and that since then that it's good to be able to have that in place and as a child i never would have thought about that being in place into and as i get older i'm more and more respectful of that yeah. you've worked with several projects over the years what are some other projects that you've been kind of involved with all right um yeah so through my schooling i uh did a historic preservation um or public history uh, program at KSU that's led for by led by uh, Dr. Jennifer Dickey. Uh, she's really cool um, and very knowledgeable. She's been involved in a lot of historic projects, uh, historic preservation projects, a lot of museum projects um, in this state. And she she used to work for the uh, state historic preservation office. Um, incredibly knowledgeable. And if anyone's interested in museum work or um, any historic work, I, I recommend uh, checking her program out. With uh, K KSU is uh, <clears throat> Kennesaw State University. Right. Not confusion with a couple other different KSUs. I just wanted to drop that in there. Right, right. Sorry about that. Oh, but, no, um, you're, you're good. Yeah, so at Kennesaw State, I uh, did a, a Daresville oral history project, uh, worked with them to record and transcribe an interview um, as part of their newer, uh, at the time, newer rounds of interviews that they were doing. I, I also did a historic house survey there where I took four four homes uh, that it was in their newer um, expanded historic district, and I added them to uh, Nargis, which uh, is a big acronym uh, that stands for. I had to write it all down, and I, I don't I don't see it anywhere on my uh, notes here. But Nargis it stands for a bunch of stuff. Um, think like geographic or geologic G N oh I don't remember G N A R G H I S something like that. Anyways it's a big Beats database. Me on the, on the, on that's, the like, that. that's really cool. That's all about like archaeology, geology, historic um preservation. And it's like a database that the State Historic Preser Preservation Office and other institutions use to um look at uh historic assets in georgia and uh so yeah i had to use that and i i updated it with these four homes um i also had a few internships one of them was with uh history cherokee which is the historical society in cherokee county uh, oh, right, georgia. Cherokee county that's where we're yeah from. that's where we are uh whoop, whoop. so with them i uh worked for their oral history program there i transcribed about six interviews with the um, historic uh, African-American communities. Uh, and I learned some really incredibly interesting histories um, from the from the commun community members there. Uh, and so I transcribed six interviews that took about um, 10 to 12 hours each interview, uh, which is insane. They're about um, one hour interviews, but uh, I had to transcribe them very specifically uh, using the uh, Baylor guide um, to oral history transcription. And it, uh, you know, it's, it's detailed because when the um, person giving the interview or the interviewee, you know, laugh or something like that, I have to, you know, put in brackets, um, you know, Charlie laughs 
or um, let's say there was a long pause. I have to put uh, in brackets long pause, you know, or uh, if they both laugh, I have to put that in brackets, you know, both laugh, you know, or anything like that. Um, and then I have to put timestamps along uh, the interview process. So if you're reading along, uh, or if, if, if you are, have a disability that you can't listen to an interview or something, you need to read it. Or if you're a researcher, you know, you have a referential point, uh, back to the interview, uh, where there was a timestamp, right? And, uh, so I do all of, you know, very in-depth, um, oral history transcription, which is incredibly meticulous, but I, re I really liked it. It was fun to me. I had this little foot pedal that, was attached to my computer where I could go back and pause and all sorts of stuff. Instead of having to click, I could keep my hands on the keys and keep typing and just tap it and pause and catch up to where it was in the audio and hit play again and keep going. It was really so you had like a modified sewing machine kind of piece yeah, to yeah. be able to hit going was, forwards backwards. It was exactly like a sewing machine foot pedal. Um, and then I also worked to provide uh, context and background research to History Cherokee's collection of stone tools um, from their Johnston collection. Uh, so those came from the Johnston family uh, in this region um, who historically held a lot of property. And one of those properties was a um, cotton farm in the 1930s. And they would always, you know, turn up artifacts. Uh, so they collected them, the family collected them, and they'd also collect them from other areas uh, around their properties. And they just, um, you know, kept them for a long time until they donated them to the History Center. And the History Center didn't have any context for them. And uh, it's actually a problem, you know, I'm talking about all this. I'm, let me say, like, if you find something crazy on your property, you can call, um, you can call someone, you can call uh, you know, your local historical society, maybe they can help you out, or you can call your, um, maybe just your state historic preservation office. They'll, they have archeologists on staff, you know, uh, call someone and, uh, have them come look at it. You know, generally they're not going to, they're not going to impose some crazy restrictions on your property that that won't happen on private property, but you might also just preserve context for, um, whatever's there so that researchers can come out and add it to the scientific record. Because if you, if you just pull it up, now you've removed it from the scientific record. We can never know, you know, what strat it was in, what strata of dirt it was in. We, we don't know what time period or contextually, which way it was laying, you know, things like that. So if you find something crazy, you, you can generally find someone to come look at it. Um, I don't know if it's free or not. I've never done that, but. It's good <clears> to know <throat> that it's out there as an option because it's right. so much time, especially as farming, you uncover so much so right. frequently. And especially this area is for a long period of time was a major farming community as time's going on now it's not as heavily as it used to be but for over 200 years it was a major farming communities right. so anyways these um stone tools that history cherokee has um we call them uh, in the archaeological field they're ppks which stands for projectile point slash knife because you don't really know what it was used for until you do analysis on it uh, so I looked at them and I typified them, um, and that to give just some context to their, their age, uh, to give, you know, if we were new from this type, if it was part of like an arch, uh, archaic period, uh, point or a woodland point or a Mississippian point, you know, or if, you know, something like that. So that gives them a, at least a little context, which they had zero, um, before. So that, that allows them to interpret better when they turn these into uh, exhibits for their museum, their upcoming museum, um, which, so they're going to have artifact drawers that, you know, you pull out and uh, you can look at all their artifacts. It's going to be really cool. So um, hopefully, hopefully I was able to help them uh, provide some context. Yeah. And it's uh, something that if you look inside your communities, there are prominent names for a reason that are remembered because they were either large landowners, they were um, major families that owned businesses in the area. If you ask within your region common names, you may learn a lot more about your local county, your local city as a whole. We had the Johnsons, and we also had the Joneses. Right. Those are two big major ones that we had here in Cherokee County. So I encourage you to do that to your community as well. Yeah, historical societies are great, great 
you know, they usually have um, some form of archive and and are open to the public for uh, research if you're curious or something. Um, so yeah, give them a shout. And our listeners for in the Cherokee County area, the Cherokee County Historical Society is moving into a new building and hopefully will be open here in the next year or yeah, so to be hopefully. able to have to the public. Yeah, they'll have a big, you know, s- big gallery uh, it, exhibit rooms, uh, something like, I don't know, maybe six or so. Uh, and it's going to be really cool. They're going to have one that is all dedicated to prehistory. So I'm excited to see that one. Yeah. Take it out and get out there and, and look into your community. That's definitely a big encouragement here because of your history is what's made you. Yeah. And um, just for you know brevity here, I'll, I'll gloss over a couple other projects I did. I, I conducted a environmental and ecological anthropological review or survey of um, Vineyard Mountain in Bartow County. So that included... Um, recording all the plants um that were in the our, our project area uh and recording the um ecotone the the little ecological zone that they um the type of you know ecological zone it was, it was i think we went with cove forest which is a very specific type of environment and uh we looked at the geology and we looked at the human use over time so that um that is a whole nother field, ecological anthropology. It's a form of cultural anthropology, and it's very interesting. Um, and then uh, I also, uh, for my research, uh, big research project there, I did at Kennesaw State University. I researched the relationship between uh, local farmers and their uh, respective communities. So I called that a a research into the social ecology of um, localized agriculture. So that was a lot of fun. I interviewed. Over a hundred people, um, citizens at uh, farmers markets and in various areas, and uh, then I also interviewed about six different farmers. I attended um, lectures that were given locally um, across North Georgia by by farmers or uh, events, and I uh, talked to them all about how they involve the community. Which, if you're curious, how do I get involved in local farms? I encourage you to go look up what uh what farms have a um oh man i'm blanking right now csa which stands for community supported agriculture oh cool which is really cool yeah if you want to get involved with a local farmer and you go to a farmer's market ask you know your favorite one if they have a csa and you can how can you get involved and generally you can go work on their farm and they will either pay you or they'll give you a box of food uh, at the end of the week you have to put in about maybe 10 hours or so that's what I, I I did it. It's kind of like a weird form of sharecropping, but you know you help your farmer out and you get food. That's a very good exchange, and also being able to <clears throat> understand where your food's coming from, what the process is to be able to make that food. Because if so, often being in cities, we are, you know, we've gotten so used to going to a farmer, not farmers market. Well, yes, farmers market, but going to your local grocery store and just go boop and pick it up walk out the door and not thinking twice about it. And I recommend any parent to take their child just to go out and volunteer and do some of this to see and help them understand the long process it takes to have a meal on your table. For sure with that, you have a garden that it took me a minute to get used to saying the words for it, the biodiverse organic permaculture no-till organic garden that you have can you tell me a little bit about that because that process was something that i hadn't really heard of my family does farming um and we do about right at about and maybe an acre worth of land that we be able to work off of but i've never had heard of that no-till process and also making it that biodiverse uh, i i know the existence of it and some i i ideology ideology of it but can you fill us in on Giving us that information here? Because that's phenomenal thinking about it. Yeah, so I got interested in that. Uh, When I was living in Athens, uh, I worked for a, like I said, I I joined a CSA. I worked for a farm, um, and it was really cool. I learned all sorts of stuff there. I learned how to start, you know, basically start from seed to to plant um, and harvest. And uh, it was a really cool experience. So that's how I got into it. Um, And then when I moved back uh, to Cherokee County, I... uh, I started my own little garden, um, started out pretty small and expanded every year. Uh, and I first started out with clay, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, a little, you know, clay loam maybe, but, uh, it was, it wasn't great. 
And so what I did was I, I went down to the lake where they dredge it. Um, it's, you know, they do it, uh, our lake, Lake Alatuni here, and uh, they just put the sand on the side of the road. You can pull over and grab it. So I got probably 20 truckloads of uh, river bottom um, silt and sand. And uh, I brought that over and I tilled that into my clay and I made um, a silt loam or a sandy loam uh, is where what I wanted to, you know, my soil structure needed to be right uh, to allow for the best um, results of my plants. And then I started adding to it uh, because you want life, you want living soil and you want to be able to reach your hand into your garden and pull up a fist full of dirt and look at it. And you, you want to know that there are billions of life forms there that are helping you. There are bacteria and mycelium and mycorrhizae that are all coursing through that sand and they all help your plants do better. Um, it's really incredible because it's all a symbiotic relationship. So, you know, endomycorrhizae in your soil will help your plants uptake more uh, nutrients and uh, it's you just have to make sure that they can live there. And they're not going to live there in straight clay, you know. So you have to uh, make make your soil structure um, closer to another another uh, structure. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, silt or sit, sandy loam, uh, something like that. And then I went and I added a lot of organic material. Uh, so I, I add a lot of compost. Uh, I get horse manure from my neighbors uh, and I compost that. Um, and if I you also reach out to horse farms. They oh, will yeah. literally load it up for you for free in yeah. order to get rid of it. It's, it's, it's out there, man. But, uh, you, I also add biochar, which is a form of charcoal that you put into your soil and your, uh, bacterias and, um, other little tiny microscopic organisms will live in there like like your little hotels of life in your soil. And so I mix all of that in um, with my compost and uh, I'll even add, I can I generally can buy uh, endomycorrhizae or um, beneficial bacteria or things like that um, from uh, seed companies. I, I use, uh, So True Seed is a great seed company, but I also use... Um, there's a company called uh, Mushroom Mountain, and they are out of Asheville. And they you can buy bags of uh, granulated my, endomycorrhizae, and you can throw that in your soil. Um, and if you've provided a great habitat for all that stuff to live, then you're going to get results. And uh, compost tea is another great way to um, help introduce some of these things into your soil. And then there's a soil technique called bukashi, and it's basically like you make um, fermented grain and things like that uh, to put into your soil or start your seeds in. And that can also jumpstart um, all these uh, living soil, you know, organisms uh, in your garden. Um, so, yeah, there's some really cool things you can do uh, to boost plant production. And so that's part of biodiversity, right? Your soil is part of your biodiversity. But then above ground, you want to foster uh, even more because you need other organisms that aren't microscopic. You need macroscopic organisms that are going to be your volunteers in the garden that are going to help you. Because if you don't use, you know, pesticides, you need something that's going to work for you. And those are uh, beneficial insects. So you want to attract uh, things like lace wings and um, parasitic wasps. So there's this really cool parasitic wasp that likes uh, dillweed and it likes fennel. So if you plant pl plenty of that out in your garden, you're going to eventually attract this wasp. And something it does is that it lays its larva, lays its egg sacs on the back of the tomato hornworm, which is this puffy green worm. Uh, if anyone's seen A Bug's Life, it looks like the caterpillar from A Bug's Life. It's, oh, cool. You know, green, and it has this horn on its posterior end. Um, it's not going to sting you. It's not going to hurt you. I, I mean... When I don't see any larvae or egg sacs on them, which are white, they look like white pillows hanging all over this thing. Um, if I don't see that, I just gather, gather them up and I feed them to my chickens and my ducks. I love them. It's the circle <clears throat> of life. Yeah. But uh, it's really exciting when I see that there are egg sacs on the back of these things because I, that knows that lets me know I'm, I'm doing my job providing a great habitat 
for other species like this parasitic wasp. So this these egg sacs will hatch, the larva will go into the uh, tomato hornworm, and it'll basically devour it from the inside. You'll see it shrivel up and turn brown, and then those larvae will go on to create more wasps, and then you'll have this whole great uh, little you know community that you've started. Um, now these, how do I recognize these differences from what, what I call like dirt daubers in the other ones? How do I recognize the okay. difference between the two so I don't kill the wrong one? So uh, in your typical wasps, like your paper wasps that'll build in, you know, in your mailbox or in the, under, the, under the eaves of your house or under a tarp, you know, on your lawnmower and uh, the ones, you know, that'll sting you, uh, you have to know that they look s- slightly different. Um, the ones that I've seen in my garden, they're they're black they are jet black and there is like it looks like a hair connecting their um what is the end of an insect is that your thorax or your set no use the cephalothorax is the the head end yeah that's the head and then i think your thorax and then is the last part but i don't know what's in the middle yeah i I don't know that middle part anyways there's uh, yeah there's the the three parts yeah it's posterior end it's it's the insect butt is connected you know it looks like a typical wasp, um, you know, cone shaped kind of like where the stinger would be. And then it's narrows down to a tiny little stick, okay. you know, and then it connects to the rest of the body. And it, so it looks, they look fragile in a way like you could just poke it and break it, break that end of the wasp off. So that's one way to recognize they, they just look different. So that black really is kind of what you're looking for right. over that kind of orangish brownish kind of color. Right. And, and also they'll be all over your fennel. You know, you'll you'll nice. see them. Um, but other things I grow uh, to attract a lot of beneficial species are um, native plants. So I grow a lot of uh, bee balm or uh, monarda or uh, let's see, what's the other name for it? Um, I've heard it called wild bergamot. Um, so I grow two species of that, uh, both native, and uh, that attracts, they're over 3,000 native bees in in our region. So not just honeybees, you need all the other ones too because they all perform very specific jobs. So you want to attract as many of these as you can. So I grow a lot of native plants and a lot of perennials uh, that hopefully will do the job of attracting these these organisms. Where do you get some of these plants at? So there's a really cool, uh, in our region, in Cherokee County, there is a cool native plant nursery called Night Song. Uh, you can check them out. They have like a Facebook. Night, like at night and day. Oh, yep, yep. Night song. So uh, they have like night song. Excuse me, I want to. So N I G H T S O N G. Right. Yeah. So they they have a lot of cool um, native species. Check them out, um, or find a native plant nursery in your region and uh, do some research and um, you know plant whatever it is to attract whatever you want. Uh, yeah. So. I grow about every every herb you can imagine. I was listing them in my mind last night, just trying to get an idea. And you know, I grow probably over 20, 20 different herbs. Wow, that 20? are just yeah, that are my just, brain can't even think of twenty. <laughs> yeah, that are just perennial. I'd list them all, but it would take too long. But um, and then you know, I grow things that are uh, non-native. So I like to grow sheep sorrel. It's a great perennial. It's I think it's technically a type of dock. Um, it's from the British Isles. It tastes tart like uh like citrusy um tartness it's it's really cool i like crunching on it um it's also a blood thinner so you can't eat too much of it if you're already on blood thinners good thing for uh to look into whenever you're planting some of these <clears throat> items and herbs and stuff like that is what what uses can it be used for uh, i'm do love the holistic atmosphere that you can be able to use a lot of the materials you have around you in order to kind of help take care of yourself yeah and so if you want to do this, if you have a vegetable garden, I know that the company um, Southern Seed Exposure has a perennial native perennial insectiary mix. So um, you can check out their insectiary mixes and uh, you just choose a spot in your garden, sow it out there. It's probably about 12 different species and um, it should stick around. I'm in about year five of it and three three species have dominated. And, oh, wow. Um, so that's like the sheep sorrel, some hill crest and some, um, chicory. And that's most of what that bed has turned into. So I should probably, you know, redo it. What does that um, cost kind of run an individual? Oh, that's, you can just buy a little packet. One little packet will do, you know, uh, 
12 by, you know, three foot, you know, rectangular bed, you know, or more it, you know, one little packet is probably $3, $4. Um, but I think so true seed also sells insectiary mixes. So check those out. If you want to, if you want to attract some beneficial insects, that's the way to go. Yeah. Always have animals and things work towards you just because you see an insect out there doesn't mean it's negative. Uh, in that matter to yes, there are negatives that come to them, but it's always good to encourage having that positive biodiversity inside of your garden uh, and putting out pesticides really actually can be very negative to your plants and being able to get them to properly grow because they need that natural pollinators in things as well in order to make sure that it is being healthy to its best capabilities. Right. So I think I've that I've covered biodiversity. I kind of covered permaculture there. Um, permaculture also means just like planting things that are always going to be there that are going to help you. Like I grow comfrey. It's great to use um, as an herb. It's called bone knit. You can literally use it to heal bones back together. It's incredible. Wow. Its healing properties are ridiculous. But anyways, um, it's also great for compost. It's a compost starter. I I gather up all the leaves and I throw it in my compost and that thing cooks, you know. If you need any uh, leaves, I've got plenty in the backyard. Oh, that <laughs> I have a whole pile at the house. I, I gathered them up, uh, you know, this month actually. And then, you know, uh, no-till, that's just so you preserve your um, structure that you've worked so hard to build. You've built these communities. You've built, you know, your mycorrhizae and your your mycelium and, and your bacteria are all there. You may want to stick a fork in there and aerate a little bit because, you know, aerobic activity helps all of that. Um, but you don't want to like turn your soil over because you're essentially destroying the um, soil microbiome. Every time you do turn the soil over, you're just resetting it and, and it can never get a foothold. And it's just, you know, a little more detrimental if you, if you do it too much. So I try not to do that. I aerate it with a fork. Um, but yeah, I try to really preserve that. That is called your soil microbiome. It's basically everything that happens under the surface of the soil. So you're outside and I see you stabbing the ground over and over with a fork. You're not yeah. angry. You're just actually trying to help. Right. I stab and then I lift a little and then I stab and I lift and I just do that along the bed and, uh, you know, usually cover it up with, um, a fresh layer of, uh, wood chips, which you can get from any tree company. You'll just drop them off at your house for free, free mulch, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. A lot of tree companies are constantly looking to try to figure out where they can dump off. And yeah. I think that's better than a lot of the times they can't find homes that need it. They'll just take it to the dump. Yeah. yeah. And this is great use of resources that are, that are there at your, at your hands. Yeah. And then, you know, I even, if I get that, I'll seed it with, um, mushrooms. I'll buy, uh, grain spawn or, um, something like that sawdust spawn from, uh, Mushroom Mountain, um, you know, Oyster or, you know, uh, what is the other one? King, King Strophoria, which is a um, wine cap mushroom. You can just literally just spread that around with your mulch. You will get, you'll get edible mushrooms come up in your garden next to your vegetables. It's pretty cool. Nice. Speaking of mushrooms, that kind of is a perfect segue into your foraging that you do. Yeah. That's something that I'm curious on whenever you're going and doing this what are you specifically looking for? Uh, what some skills you can be able to provide to our listeners? Like, where do you go to really do this? And do I need a license or something if I'm going on to a national park or somewhere and just start, start collecting this? Because if, if I see somebody randomly out picking stuff, I'm like, is that legal? Is it not legal? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a blurry area. I think it depends on what you're taking. Um, mycelium and mushrooms might might be okay. Uh, But it gets hairy when you get into harvesting um, plants. So you can, you're not, you're really not supposed to harvest plants from a national forest or anything, but you can get a pass to do that if you go to your um, Department of Natural Resources, uh, generally their head center, I think ours is in like Calhoun or something like that. And you can get, there's so many licenses they'll issue every year for uh, foragers who want to harvest things like ramps, which are um, an allium, they're they're garlic, onion, um, kind of thing. Uh, and they're so delicious, but, um, in our state, they're, they're more rare because they only grow above a certain elevation. And I won't tell you which, because I don't want people running out, finding them all, you know, and destroying the ecology there in Georgia. But, you know, in Virginia and other places, they'll have full festivals celebrating these foods because they're delicious. Um, but yeah, there are, there are licenses, foraging licenses you can get, uh, that allow you to take certain amounts of these plants every, uh, every season. Uh, and so, um, 
you can go that route or you can just try and stay on private private property private lands um, you can find official mushroom forays with people that know what they're doing uh, on Facebook groups. I think there's one for ours called Georgia Mushrooming, and I follow it on Facebook. Uh, and, you know, it has some really um, good people in it that will help you ID a mushroom. Um, but you can also, the best way to do that is called a spore print. So you, or if you're curious about it, you pull off the cap, you put it on a piece of dark paper, you let it sit for like an hour or so, or, you know, that may be too much time. Sometimes it takes less. But anyways, you remove it and you'll see the color of spores. It's really cool. It creates a cool design, honestly. And when you look at it, you can then use that and you can use the gill structure usually to um, find out what type of mushroom it is uh, because spore color is, is very big into deciding that, especially with mush- mushrooms that have lookalikes. But uh, I, I typically forage ones that I know for a fact um, don't don't have a lot of lookalikes or once you know the differences, it's super easy to spot. So you have... Uh, in our region, chanterelles are a big one people forage. And so you have, um, cinnabar chanterelles and which are red and yellow or orange chanterelles. And so those are very popular to get. Um, I harvest uh, a lot of oyster mushroom. Those are my favorite. Mm. Um, they're easy to recognize. Um, they have a kind of a distinct smell to me. It's sometimes it's kind of like peppermint almost. Um, there's lion's mane so easy to recognize it looks like a white ball that is covered in like these white hair drippy looking like hairs i guess but they're a little thicker than hairs but they look strange you know you can look up a picture of lion's mane and there's nothing else that looks like it (laughs) i mean there's others in its family that look like it but they're also edible so hey good thing um there's something called a wood ear it's a type of uh, jelly fungus And it can be freaky because it can look exactly like an ear. Um, So that's used in like a lot of Asiatic cooking, Asian cooking. um, And it's, you know, perfectly fine to eat. So there's a lot of easy ones out there um, that once you know how to recognize them, you'll always recognize them. Uh, So I recommend people get out there, find some uh, hen of the woods is another one or the chicken of the woods, which is totally separate, different one. Tastes like chicken, guys. And it structure when you cook it up it's stringy just like chicken it'll blow your mind look up some youtube videos or stuff on that because there's a lot of really neat ones that it doesn't take a lot to actually make it into like a chicken nugget right and a lot of people have been doing that and it's really neat to be able to see that but yeah do some research like the chicken of the woods one in a million people will have an allergic reaction because it is a sulfurous mushroom so if you have a sulfur allergy stay away from that one you know but most of them are fine that i've mentioned like the oyster mushroom there's not really any lookalikes to that one you you'll have a blast finding it it's growing right now we're having a great flush in georgia right now in december um from oyster mushroom so yeah check them out now make sure whenever he's saying private property get permission just yeah, don't start permission. walking onto someone's private property and, and looking for stuff that will in georgia lead to uh some interesting confrontations because a lot of people in in the south are have guns and we'll we'll meet you out there yeah. with them for sure but yeah always um ask if you're going during hunting season uh check to see if there's anyone going to be on the property as well wear orange yeah definitely wear orange uh for sure I- i'm doing that but don't just randomly start walking onto people's property or if you're in a national park to make sure that you are on trails and you're allowed to be able to go and ask before you start kind of picking off certain uh certain things because you may be interrupting a specific habitat or something like that right maybe there's like a weird study an ecological study happening and they're like no we need you know we got some mycologists out there or something yeah that's why you have your rangers to be able to kind of help and ask that now as we're coming towards the end of this time period what is some advice that you would kind of like to share that maybe we haven't touched on for kind of like a life life lesson here for these individuals um honestly you know take your time uh, take your time and find out what you love and do it because it took me 10 years to get my degree. I, I was, um, it was my third major, uh, anthropology was, and, uh, I took two, two breaks, um, you know, in between this, you know, they, one of them lasted more than a year and I just didn't know where I was going. And, uh, I had to let myself, uh, find, find out what I didn't want to do. Um, and I traveled around a little bit and uh, I ended up, you know, completing my degree and very happy where I am. Uh, I didn't let anyone push me 
into something I didn't want to do. And, uh, you know, here's another quote. I'd rather be at the bottom of a ladder that I want to climb than halfway up one that I don't want to climb. And so, you know, take your time, um, figure it out, uh, take a break when you need to. Um, and you know, find, find some people that'll support you, um, along the way. Cause my family always supported me and, uh, you know, inspired me and that's great. And your family, it goes a long way having a good supportive family to kind of back up to it. And sometimes if you don't have the supportive family, look towards your friends because your, your friends are your family. You choose Definitely. as mm-hmm. well to do that. Um, this has been an amazing conversation that I'm glad that I'm getting to share with this community on episode uh, six and a half uh, for this uh, for this time to it. I cannot say enough with, I would have never had this conversation with Will if I never would have started this podcast or started actually asking questions into my community. That's something I recommend every single episode of open up your mind to something a little different and ask questions of your friends or family that you may be surprised with the answers you get or the interest that they have that you never would have thought of. But when you ask that question, you open up a new door and people are the experts of their own life and they have something to share with you. In this holiday season, you're going to be around a lot of family. You're going to be able to see a lot of different people that maybe you haven't seen for a while. Um, for those that aren't, um, it's okay. I know this is a rough time for a lot of people as well, um, and, and it can be a lonely time. But definitely take any opportunity you can with the family you currently have on this earth to, even if that's mending a relationship, just starting a conversation and asking and reconnect with old friends like I did here today of reconnecting with Will at this time period. So as we're kind of coming to an end, of this evening. Will, thank you for sharing this time with me. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I I hope you and other people have learned something nice. Yeah, that's the whole lovely point of learning from friends here. Uh, As I leave, I hope you have had a wonderful holiday season. I hope you continue to listen to the podcast. You can reach out to me at Cade, which is C-A-D-E, at learningfromfriends.com. Will, if someone wanted to reach out to you and ask some questions, is there a way that they can be able to reach out to you? Uh, you know, I am not always responsive, but uh, I do have an email. You can uh, feel free to ask me about anthropology or gardening or foraging or or whatever strikes your fancy uh, at wfrye1 at gmail.com. That is the uh, number one. Ah, gotcha. So remember, everyone, as you leave today, to let your curiosity fly high. I'll catch you again next time. Goodbye.